Heavenly Father, we come to you this time thanking you for this day, thanking you for the wonderful opportunity it is to have a period of time tonight where we can study your word, where we can just get away from all the things that exist in our lives and simply just know that inside of your word we can truly find hope, that we can find peace, and that we can find comfort. We pray, Father, that as we're here tonight, we will be ever so thankful that we're here but even more so thankful, Father, that your word will be opened and we'll study together. We're thankful tonight for the opportunity for us in this class and for all the other classes that are in the back as they study. We're thankful for those teachers in the back who've prepared this week and for, for all the young people who are back there and participating in their class. We're thankful for them and for the encouragement they give. That class and that hallway is a, a resounding uh, scene of energy, and we're thankful, Father, for them. We pray, Father, a very special prayer upon our upcoming Christian Servants Day at the end of the month. We pray, Father, for Glenn Colley and for Keith Mosier as they are both preparing for this day. We pray for their travel and for the travel of those that will be with us. And we pray, Father, that we'll challenge ourselves to be here and to participate in Christian Servants Day. We pray, Father, as we're here tonight, once, once again, that we'll be thankful and that we will be glad that we are here. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, I appreciate you being here tonight and us having an opportunity to study. I do want to uh, mention something now uh, so I don't forget to mention it. Uh, we will see this uh, banner sort of before us every Sunday night and Wednesday night. I know I've left it here, the one right here for our evangelism ministry that we're starting. Um, I'm going to leave that out every Sunday night into Wednesday. That way it has to be before us. That way we have to see it. And that way it will be a reminder to us to be thinking about that as we uh, see more information being revealed to us in the next few weeks about the uh, compassion card groups, about all the things that we'll be doing. So that's going to be in here every Wednesday night as well. Doesn't mean we'll be studying that information, uh, but do want to mention this. I said Sunday night that uh, upcoming on Sunday the 14th, on the Sunday night, we would start our series with the, with the booklets. Um, I misspoke. We'll be doing that the following Sunday night. I'll be out of town uh, Thursday through Tuesday. Uh, we'll be at a young adult retreat doing that for a congregation. And so I won't be back until Tuesday. Uh, so we'll have some guest speakers in this Sunday, and uh, that'll be with the Scattered Abroad Network with Caleb. I want to mention this to you. If you don't... Uh, have any of that downloaded on your phone. Um, if you can't find it, I know if you get with Caleb, you get with me, we'll help you find it. Uh, but they have a podcast every day that's released, and that'll be good for you, extra Bible study. Uh, so be thinking about the Scattered Abroad Network. But Houston Welch, uh, one of the podcasters there, will teach the Bible class on Sunday morning, and he'll preach uh, Sunday morning, and then Caleb will preach Sunday night. But we will not be doing the uh, booklet start until the following Sunday night. I misspoke Sunday evening. Uh, just it's hard to keep your schedule in your brain. Does anybody else have that problem? Make sure you know where you're supposed to be. I always just think I'm going to be here, and sometimes I'm not. So uh, I apologize if, if you were planning on that, but we'll get that in, I promise. I wanted to make sure it was delayed so we could start it and keep going all the way. All right, we're in 1 John. We're in chapter 2. We've been studying this uh, particular book with a theme in total of love one another, the whole uh, Five chapters of this book of 1 John ha has this theme of binding the church together, uh, binding God's people together, and it does so in one avenue. Do you know what that avenue is? How are we bound together? By the Word. That, that's it. All of this is centered around the Word. And matter of fact, I, I don't know if this has happened to you so far. It has with me. Uh, I've studied First John before, and I know you have, but it seems this time as I study it, I, I keep seeing this idea of a dependence on the Word that keeps coming up. And that's going to be part about what our class is about tonight. But we are uh, going to be talking about the life. Uh, we've talked about the joy, the light, the advocate, the watch. Remember last week we talked about that antichrist, that person that would, would, would be against Christ and this idea of what's going to happen there to watch for and other things. And tonight we're going to talk about the life. And then we'll pick back up next Wednesday evening in chapter 3 talking about the love. So let's, let's get ourselves together and let's start talking about the four things that we're going to look at. And then hopefully tonight we'll have the opportunity to get to our little extra. We didn't get to do that last week, but hopefully we will be able to tonight. Here's the four things we're going to look at. We're going to look at the brain. When's the last time you thought about your brain? You either. 
<laughs> Me too. Tonight we're going to talk about our brains because there's something that we've got to do. There's something that we've got to engage, and it's going to be found right here as we study tonight looking at verse 24. Then we're going to look at the promise. You know, God has made a promise to all people. By the way, before you look at 1 John 2, does anybody know what that promise is? What promise has God made to all of mankind? Salvation. Salvation, the promise of eternity, the promise of heaven. And that's going to be talked about tonight, and it's involved in what we're going to discuss. And it has to do with your brains, the brain, the promise. And then there's going to be this scene that I've called the answer. You and I need to have this answer in our lives. We're going to see it tonight. And then we're going to see, as we close out chapter 2, uh, this idea of calling. And when we get down to the latter part of chapter 2, we're going to see a phrase that we've noticed several times in this book already, little children. He, he's, going to bring it, he's going to build us up, and then he's going to bring us back down to where we need to be so that we can open our eyes and truly see how God calls you and I in this life today. And then hopefully we'll have enough time to turn to the back of your handout and do our extra. But if not, those are questions that you can answer at home. And I promise you, the answers are right here. The answers will be the same answers that are going to be on the screen. We're basically going to say the answers to all the questions, but these are the eight things that stand out in our class as we go through, and you can do that. Hopefully, we'll be able to do it together as we go. Let's start off by looking at verse 24 and jump into our study. 1 John 2, verse 24. Let that therefore abide in you, which ye have heard from the beginning, that if ye have, or if that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, you also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. Let's talk about your brain for just a minute. I don't know about you, but I don't think about my brain very often, do you? Matter of fact, until I wrote the word brain today, I hadn't thought about my brain all week. Anybody else? I probably, like you, haven't thought about my brain all month. <laughs> well, that's the problem. That's why we're not thinking about our brains. Sometimes we're not using them. You do have to use it. But in the context of what he's telling us here, he, he, he begins with a section that says, Let that therefore abide in you. So what we've got to do in verse 24 is we've got to remember what's happening. Well, what is that that needs to abide? Well, go back up to verse 23. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. Do you remember what we ended talking about last week in our class? The whole idea that Jesus is real. And we asked a couple of questions of ourselves through our class last week, and one of them that stands out the most was, is Jesus real to you and to me? That whole idea is the foundation of everything that takes place in the last part of the chapter, and by the way, is going to be the foundation as we start next week, because look at 1 John 3 verse 1. Look at the very first word. Behold, it, it, it's, it's very akin to therefore. It, it's going to build on this idea that Jesus Christ is real, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that Jesus Christ is the Savior. And that information has to be something that abides in us. He, he is real. Now, matter of fact, this word abide, let that therefore abide, it's a word that means remain, number one, if you look this up with Thayer. It means remain. So the fact that Jesus is real, that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus is the Savior, that needs to remain with us. But it can't sit idle because this word abide does not just mean stay. It means sojourn. It, it goes on a journey with you everywhere that you go. So, so here's what's interesting about this. When, when you got up this morning, what fact had to be with your life? Well, Jesus is real because he is the Son of God, because Jesus is God, because Jesus is the Savior. That's how you start your day. You begin your sojourning through that day. When you went out this morning, if you went out, what, what fact had to go along with you? Jesus is still real. Here's something that's true. Jesus is not just real in church buildings. Jesus is not just real in church buildings. It's very easy to make Jesus real right now, isn't it? Why? Because what are we here to do? We're here to study what? The Bible. What, what does the Bible center around? Jesus. It's really easy to see a real Jesus right now because what are we talking about? Him. That's what the, the, the foundation of tonight is. It sojourns with us as we go through our day. Even tonight, Jesus had to be, has to be real to you. 
if Jesus is not real, then what about his word? And that's not real either. I believe sometimes what we do in our personal lives is one of our greatest struggles is to remember and to sojourn with the idea that Jesus is real. It's not just a word that means remain or sojourn. It means continue to be present. It's not just something I'm going to take with me in the back of my mind. You know, there are numbers and things that we have to remember every day. Now, don't say this out loud, and I won't either, but, but just answer this in your mind. What's your debit card pin number? You know that, don't you? Now, for those of you that don't use debit cards, what's your bank account number? You write that check, you, you, you know that number. There are things that we remember every day. Okay, think about this. Think about your key ring where all your keys are. Do you know the order of your key ring? Well, maybe I'm just the only one that does that. That's a bad illustration. Let, let's see if that one. I know the order. I don't know why that is. Okay, we'll let that go. Am I the only one? Oh. <laughs> All right. Can we rewind three minutes and start over? I'm not giving any more illustrations on this. I'm scared to do that now. But here's the idea. We know certain pieces of information, don't we? That has to be Jesus in our lives. There are crucial parts of our lives that we just know, we remember, we don't have to think about it. It's second nature. I know it. That's Jesus being real in your life as you're going about your day. But then it means this, not just to, to, to be present with, it means to wait for. What are you and I waiting on right now? Think about it. I'll give you an illustration because I'm scared to give any others. But, but what are we waiting for? Heaven. We're waiting on the Lord to return. So, so this idea, the last part of this chapter starts with Jesus being real and you and I having something to abide with. But where does he abide in, and what does this information abide in? In you. It's very personal. It's something you do, it's something I do, it's something we do as a group. We've got to use our brain to let these things go. And, and how do we use our brain? Well, it's the things that we've heard from the beginning. I, I believe there's two different connotations to this, but number one, we can think about Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. What is in Genesis 1, 1? In the beginning. Okay. Who is in verse 1? Okay. Define God for me. Father, Son, and Spirit. Holy Ghost, same thing. Father, well, I, I like to say in the Old Testament, and I do this because of John chapter 1, verse 1 through 14, the Father, the Word, and the Spirit, that, that's who He was in the Old Testament. We don't have to make that justification, but I like to. But think about this. In the very beginning, who was there? Jesus, the Father, and the Spirit. But I think there's another connotation to this because I want you to compare God and man. Is there a difference in God and man? Ooh, yeah. Kind of makes you wake up, doesn't it? There is a big difference in God and man. Can you, can you tell me the biggest difference between God and man? I agree. God's all-powerful, all-knowing. So there's not just one, huh? Here, I think, is the biggest at least to us it should be, God is not involved in sin as man is involved in sin. Man commits sin. God is about removing sin. That's a big difference, isn't it? So in our day-to-day, -day, that's a big difference, isn't it? But here's something that happens, and it's what we learn about this, and it's something we need to know when we use our brains thinking about God. The Word will always bring light to a dark world number of passages you could look up in that first John chapter 2 verse 7 matter of fact you go back in this chapter and you see this brethren I write no new commandment unto you it's all about learning using your brain that's what this is about and we're going to see that as we walk through this tonight as we see this together and if we do this it shall remain in you right here in verse 24 here's the point the truth is to, re to remain, to abide, to stay with and stay in the follower of God. What happens when we give up truth? Now, 
That's right. Yeah, that's right. Now, I'm not talking about the truth of this world. Now, there are some truths in this world, aren't there? There, there is a difference between the truth in this world and the truth that God gives. Okay, what's one plus one? Two. That's true, isn't it? Always going to be true. That's not the truth we're talking about here. There are things in this world that are always going to be true, no matter what wor the world may try to decide. But I want you to think about spiritual truth. These things shall remain in you. These things that have been talked about, they'll remain in you. And in doing so, you can remain in God, we're going to see in a moment. But I want you to go back with me to John. Go with me to John 15, because John is using the words of Jesus, the very idea of what Jesus did. Go with me to John 15. I want you to notice verses 3 through 7. This correlates over to what's happening here. John 15, 3 through 7. It reads this way. Talking about Jesus, here he's speaking. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him. The same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me... He is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and, and men get them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Here's the point. If we're willing to use our brains and remain in this knowledge and remain in the words of Jesus, what's going to happen? I will be a follower of of Jesus. It will change the way I think. Tell me yes or no, true or false. If you stick with the words of the Bible, your life will be different than the world. It's true. It's always going to be true. And that's not true from the world. That's true from who? From God. So, so we've got to use our brain to get this idea. And he tells us if we do this, we'll, we'll continue in the Son, we'll continue in the Father. This is the unspoken benefit of staying in the Word. I stay with the Son, I stay with the Father. I stay where I'm supposed to be. You ever thought about sin for just a minute? Just think about sin. Just in general. What does sin do? Separates. separates. Sin separates us from who? God. Is God the one doing the moving or are we? We are. But we can abide in those things. We can stay in Him if we what? Use our brains. This is the unspoken benefit of staying inside the Word. You know, many times we miss the point and we only see what God can do for us upon this earth. You know, Scripture was not written just for what God can do here. Isn't that true? Really, Scripture is written for what God is going to do there, right? Right? The here is just the in-between, isn't it? This is just the what? Temporary home. This is not the permanent dwelling place of the soul, is it? So if we will focus on what God has said, if we will use our brains as God intended, if we will abide in this information, which is all about Jesus, and if it's all about Jesus, it's all about His Word. You cannot have Jesus and ignore the Scriptures. You cannot have Jesus and ignore the church. You cannot have Jesus and not change your life. That's what he's telling us here. You've got to use your brain. You've heard this from the beginning. It's not different. It's not new. You use your brain. Verse 24. Now, we move from the brain and we move into this promise. And this is what's going to happen in verses 25 and 26. And this is the promise that he hath promised us even eternal life. These things I have written unto you concerning them that seduce you. An interesting word there in verse 26. But let's notice a few things from verse 25. And this is the promise. Uh, Guy in Woods wrote this in his commentary uh, on 1st, 2nd, 3rd John in the Gospel Advocate. He said this, From this verse we learn, and he means two things. Number one, eternal life is promised. And number two, that promise is conditioned on our holding fast that which we heard from the beginning. If you believe in Jesus... Verse 24, if you abide in that information and he abides inside of you, there is a conditional equation here. Number one, 
I've got to know that eternal life was offered or promised. Matter of fact, that's the very beginning, isn't it? You go back to the book of Genesis. What, what does God promise man? E- eternal life. What does God do for man? He reveals the plan for eternal life. Genesis 3.15 What does God do for man? He already has things in motion to take care of man. What does God do for man? Fast forward all the way to the New Testament. You look at all the history of the Old Testament. What did God do for man? He brought about a Savior. Specifically, we should say it this way. He brought about the Savior. Because how many Saviors are in this world? One. He wasn't a Savior. He was the Savior. And I know that's semantics. But we really need to get that into our minds. There are not multiple saviors. There's one. There's Jesus. And because of that, that's the promise, eternal life. But that promise is conditional, isn't it? You can't say you're a follower of Christ, but really follow the world, can you? It doesn't work that way. That's right. And many times we try to play both edges of the fence. We, we try to do what we want, and then we try to look like the Christian. Does God see through that? We may never notice it from somebody else. And that's not our job, is it? Is it our job to call someone a hypocrite? It's easy, isn't it? Is it our job to call people hypocrites? We're afraid to answer that. We're afraid to say yes. Uh We're afraid to say no. That's right. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. We've got to be people of the word. Everything we study tonight is about being people of the word. That's right. Paul did with or Paul did did with San Peter to what? To his face. He didn't tell everybody else about it, did he? Mm. Maybe that's the difference in us and Paul. What did Paul use as his reasoning? Scripture. What would we use? I think. Probably the most dangerous statement among church people is I think. You know, we've got to call out error. But you know what we've got to do before all that takes care of? I've got to get my life right. Before I can ever look anywhere else. And that is difficult, folks. That is difficult. We need to call out error, but we need to call ourselves on error first. Because there's a promise. This is conditional. This, this thing that was from the beginning, this thing that's being talked about, this eternal life can only be promised by the living God. Because if God is dead, there is no eternity. Therefore, how do you know that God is not dead? How would you prove that God is not dead? That's right. You said a word, though, that's important. Evidence. That's right. Certainly what the scriptures teaches us. But it's evidence, folks. How do you know he's promised? Evidence. That's right. Look at the world. Look at what's going on. Now, I know just as much as you do that there are people who believe this world came about in different means. I I know there are theories out there. I I know that. You do, too. But I also know that a design demands a designer. I also know that a creation demands a creator. These are simple things. I also know, and you know this, and the scientific community knows this, that things only reproduce after their own. There's a design in this world. That's right. That's right. That's right. All of Christ. And what's interesting is a lot of the things about humanity, about human beings, is true throughout the rest of the world, isn't it? 
You, you cannot have eternity with a dead God. Do you know why the God of Dagon out of the Old Testament is not prevalent in our world today? Because he's always been dead. He's never been alive. That's right, some, something else came after and they put him on the shelf. You'll never put God on the shelf. Matter of fact, you'll never box God up. Because he is what? Living. Now there are a lot of references and I wish we had time to look at this idea of eternal life and the promise. But I've put them in the handout so you can look at those at home when thinking about this promise. He's promised it. And you roll into verse 26. Written unto you, this idea here. This promise that has been written unto you. These things I've written unto you concerning them that seduce you. All right, now listen. You go back in the chapter. You go back in the chapter. You go back in the book. And what do you find? There are people who are saying Christ is dead. There are people saying Christ never was here. There are people saying, well, Christ never took a human body. The Gnostics. And John calls them in this book Antichrist or those that are against Christ. Christ. That's what that word means. It's not some fancy word to mean there's going to be one single person that'll stand above all the rest. Here's the truth. Evil is evil. False things are always false things. There's not going to be one that's going to trump the other. But in this idea, there are people who are trying to seduce you, trying to pull you away. This word seduce means to lead astray. There are people in this world and in the world when John wrote originally who were trying to have it their way. Are there people today religiously that are trying to have it their way? We don't have to name them by name, but we know they're true. Or we know that it is true that there are people today that are trying to have it their own way. That's why you have people in this day who say you just need to say a little prayer. That's why the idea of being baptized by being sprinkled is in this world or poured. Is a sprinkling baptism? Is a pouring baptism? What is baptism and how do you know? Now, how do you know? Evidence. That brain connects to that promise because of the evidence. There's always going to be people with false things. But it better not be us. Because these antichrists, remember, we asked this when we talked about them in the book. Where did they come from? John wrote it. He said, which came from us. You know where spiritual error comes from? Spiritual people. Don't let it be us. Don't let us be seduced by one. And don't let us seduce others with our own ideas. This means that there are constant and persistent threats to the security of the Christian because what you put in will come out every time. Every time. That's never going to be false. What you put in is going to come out. So what do we put in? The promise. What was the promise? We go back in the verse, we look at it again, and this is the promise that he hath promised us, that God has promised even eternal life. There are a lot of promises in Scripture, but he's, he's singling out eternal life here. If you want to be in heaven, what's he saying? You can be. And that's the promise that God has made. So we go from the brain, the promise. Let's see the answer as we roll through our class together. This is verse 27. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is true, and is no lie. And even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. All right, does anybody else want to explain this verse? <laughs> there you go, I thought so. This is, folks, connected with what we looked at before. Um, let me find the verse that I need us to see here. Uh, this is, as we've talked about before in this, let's see. All right, go back to verse 20. But ye have an unction from the Holy One. Who's the Holy One? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, okay. Verse 27, you know what it's talking about? The Holy Spirit. Now I'll call it John. And John received mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. That's right. And others, listen, here's what we need to know. I I want us to walk through a few things, and then we're going to try to to wrap it up in a pretty little bow because this is the most complicated verse of 1 John in its entirety. Okay? Now, let's just walk through some things, then I'm going to go back and make some comments. Number one, in verse 27, the anointing which you have received of him. Remember when this was written. It was not written in 2021. It was written when spiritual gifts were still active, okay? But there was a time, 1 Corinthians talked about this, when those things are going to cease. Have miraculous events in this world ceased? Yes. There's not a person alive that can perform a miracle. There's not a person alive, if we look at verse 27, in a whole that has this anointing from the Holy Spirit so that they have this knowledge. That's what's being talked about here. There are people that we're talking about in this particular scene that had no need to be taught. Why? Because they had a spiritual gift of understanding. Ah, spiritual gifts. Go back to 1 Corinthians. Remember, here's something we need to know. We have the Word of God in our hands. And though as an amazing as it would be, let me tell you, as a preacher, you know how awesome it would be to have all understanding of the things of God? Oh, man. But you know what that means? Some people didn't have an understanding of all things of God. Look how blessed we are. We think about the miraculous, we think about how amazing it would have been, and it would have been, but you and I have the Word of God in our hands. We have the answers right before us. It's been proven It's been shown. He goes on to say this is the truth. There's no lie, even as it has taught you. Now, the Word and the Spirit teach the same things. By the way, is it it fair to say that you are led by the Spirit? Yes. All Scripture is given by what? Inspiration of who? That's the work of the Holy Spirit. John chapter 14, verse 27, but the Comforter will bring you into remembrance all things whatsoever I've taught you. Ah, we know what the Holy Spirit teaches, what Jesus taught. Same thing that the Father taught because Jesus constantly said, I'm here to do the will of him, him that sent me and accomplish his will. Listen, I know that when we get to verses about the Holy Spirit, we, we kind of do this and say, oh no. And we read the next verse. Don't be scared of these passages. They're actually really good for us because what they tell us is these people that were living in the time we're reading about. Remember, put it into its context. There were people who knew the truth. You know what he was telling them? Verse 27, those of you that know the truth, you stand up against these antichrists because you know what's true. Not everybody had the written word in the time we're reading about. We are spoiled beyond our belief. We have the written word. We know what's true, but the application is still the same. How many of us can stand up to error? How do you do it? It's right here with the word. That's why tonight was all about the word. Everything we're studying about tonight is about the word. Now, are there other things I'd like to know about verse 27? You betcha. But I don't live in a time of miraculous gifts. I don't. Do you have all understanding? I don't either. I only have what the Word of God teaches me, and I know that there were people who had miraculous gifts, who had miraculous measures of the Spirit, and this is what we're talking about. This type of person, they knew what the truth was, which tells me something so important. It's the answer we've been trying to get to. There is a truth. There is a truth, and you and I have it. All right, answer this question, and we'll move on. Matter of fact, we'll move our PowerPoint on. Does the Word of God contradict itself? then we have the truth. If we find a contradiction in God's word, then we don't have the truth. (laughs) You're right. You are so right. Phil said if you find a a contradiction, that means you misunderstood it. That's right. Uh, There's a book, and I forgot who wrote it, and the title of it is Alleged Contradictions. A lot of things are alleged in this day. So the brain, the promise, the answer, which is God's word, is true. Let's see the calling. Last two verses. Last two verses, 28 and 29. And now, ooh, look at this word, little children, abide in him that when he shall appear we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. 
If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone that doth righteousness is born of him. All right, we're talking about the Savior. Now, now John 14, 26 is the idea of us following the Spirit. God's going to give the Spirit. The apostles were going to receive the Spirit. Others were going to receive the Spirit. He was only going to teach what Jesus taught. When you read the words of John, who are you reading the words of? By extension, Jesus. And now, little children, abide in who? In him, which is Jesus here in the context. In your hope, because your hope is found in Christ. We're going to talk about this as we go through. In his return, because it's Jesus that's going to come back. In, in the judgment day, who's going to be the one to do the judging in the judgment day? Jesus. What's he going to use? The word, his words. What, what we have, what the apostles taught, what the apostles were taught. He says, little children abide in him. Here, here's what he's telling us. He's brought us up this crescendo to bring us back down to say, listen clearly. That's what he's telling us. Listen clearly. The truth is there, even though there's a lot of noise in our world. Is there noise in our world right now? False things? There is, isn't there? Matter of fact, maybe now more than ever, there's a lot of noise. He goes and says this, when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him and his coming. You know, the second coming of Christ could happen at any time. And thus, as Christians, we have confidence. And that word confidence means to speak without fear. Which gives us a little insight into the day that the Lord's going to return. There are going to be those who want to say that I am his and they'll never be heard. This confidence is not that we are righteous, but it is that God is righteous. This confidence is not look at what we've done, but it's look what God has done. This confidence is based on you abiding in him. And thus you can say that you are his. And inside of verse 29, if you know that he is righteous, this is, this is a big point. Jesus is real. We started with that, we end with that. Jesus is real. It's probably the theme of chapter 2 over anything else. We're back to that main point. Certainly, we need to understand that there can be no doubt in our faith of Jesus Christ. There can't be any questioning of that. We can't question if he's real or not because if we're making that question, we don't know. I've got to be sure of my faith. I've got to know if you know. Verse 29 ends with the biggest word inside of Scripture. If. If you know. Does that mean that does that mean that you will? It means you have a choice if you know that Jesus is real. And then he goes on to talk about how we live. You know, if we're unjust, if we're dishonest, if we're false in this life, we won't be his. And therefore that confidence, that standing up and saying that I am his, it won't be there. That two-facedness will never get us there. However, we need to know that we will never belong to God if we belong to the world. It just doesn't work like that. I, I can't be both. And as I look at all this together, as I pull it all together, here's what I learn. I've got to be little children, verse 28. Because in doing so, I'm looking to the purity of the Father. That phrase, little children, I'm telling you, anytime you see it, stop there and look at it. Because there's something big happening there. And here's what it is. When he shall appear, I've got to be like what? Little children. What did Jesus say that we've got to become like? Little children. That, that's a reference back to the book of John. It's said often in the book of John, my little children. Remember Jesus brought little children unto him and, and said, if you're not like these, you can't be in what? The kingdom of heaven. Ooh, that's big. So he's bringing us to this great crescendo that you and I can understand that you and I can know. So that ends chapter 2, but remember something. Look at chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, everything in chapter 3, I promise you, will stand on this fact that Jesus Christ is real. So tonight, we made it. We've got about four minutes, maybe three, to look at our questions. So let's look at our questions. They're all in your handout. I'll read them to you. They're not on the screen. Okay, how does the Word remain in us? By the word, but how do we keep it in our, how do we keep it in our lives? That's right. I've got to get in it. If, if God's word's going to remain in me, what do I have to do? Got to get on it. If, if I'm going to have food in my body and it, that food's going to remain, what do I have to do? I've got to keep eating. Okay, we get that. 
All right, here's the, here's the big question. Are God's blessings only for the earth? No. God's blessings are, are, are in the eternal. Matter of fact, I would suggest to you there are more blessings in eternity than on the face of the earth. Number three, this is from our second section, the promise. The first is the brain, second, second is the promise. What is the promise? Eternal life. Okay, now we're getting it. That's the big picture. He's talking in broad themes here, but he's really narrowing it down. Eternal life. Okay, here we go. Let's see if we picked up on this one. Who's the Antichrist? Oh, there we go. That's the answer. Those that are against Christ. There's not just one singular Antichrist. Now, I know in First and Second Thessalonians, there's a man who's going to call himself God. I know, but he's just one of many people who are against Christ. Maybe the question we should ask is, will we ever be Antichrist? I hope not. But what did John say about the Antichrist? They're going to come from us. That's big. That's big. All right, here's number five. Is God's word enough? This is the answer that we studied. Is God's word enough for us? It should be. The answer should be yes. It should just, it should just pop off. Yeah, it's enough. Why? Because if God said it, it's true. If God said it, it's true. It's God's word, isn't it? Both backed up by Jesus, by the Father, and by the Spirit. Here is number six. Are spiritual gifts active today? Okay. Because we, we got to get that one. Because if we, if we don't get that one, then we're going to think, verse 27, that, that those things could be going on. We need to know that. How does God call us today? Verse number seven. By his word. Okay, see that theme in, in, in the last part of chapter two? It's all about the word. And that's been our last three weeks. It's been all about the word. He does it through his word. And here's number eight. You can do number nine, number 10. They're filling the blanks. Here's number eight. Does God force us to be faithful? Did God force you to become a Christian? No. Does God force you to do anything? He wants us. He's given us the opportunity, but he doesn't make us. Therefore, I start to understand something. Those people that were among us, John wrote, that became antichrist, they walked away from God. I don't know what drove them away from God. I, I don't know. I wish I could tell you. But they left God for whatever reason, which probably tells us there's multiple things that can keep us away from God. So we've seen the brain, the promise, the answer, the calling. And we got to the extra in time for the third bell tonight. We will pick up next week right here in chapter 3. Really be looking at verse 1. Behold, there's something big coming next week. And we'll see it together as we study uh, what we're specifically going to look at inside of this particular section will be good for us, I think. We'll see something that God has bestowed on us that will help us. So thank you so much for your comments and your participation in class tonight. Thank you.